Welcome. My name is Bob Roth. I'm the executive director of the David Lynch Foundation, and it's my very great fortune to be interviewing and speaking with Dr. Norman Rosenthal, the author of the soon-to-be best-selling book, uh, Supermind, How to uh, Boost Performance and Live a Richer and Happier Life Through Transcendental Meditation. We're calling this Supermind Sunday because we have an opportunity to speak with Dr. Rosenthal about uh, why he wrote this book. It is an update from his best-selling book, Transcendence, which many of you I know have read. And this Supermind is a fantastic read. It goes into the uh, bookstores on Tuesday, May 17th. I'll be talking more about that in a moment. But before we begin, it's my honor to do a proper introduction to you, Dr. Rosenthal, so our viewers have an idea of what a distinguished researcher and psychiatrist and exponent of a scientific reality that you are. Dr. Rosenthal is a world-renowned psychiatrist, researcher, and best-selling author. He first described something called Seasonal Affective Disorder, SAD, and pioneered the use of light therapy as a treatment during his 20 years as a senior researcher at the National Institute of Mental Health. Dr. Rosenthal is currently clinical professor of psychiatry at Georgetown University School of Medicine. As a highly... I thought you had your eyes closed there. <laughs> you were meditating? As a highly cited researcher, he has written over 200 scholarly articles and authored or co-authored eight popular books, which include Winter Blues, the New York Times bestseller Transcendence, and The Gift of Adversity. Dr. Rosenthal has practiced psychiatry for over three decades and has treated and coached people from all walks of life. He has also conducted numerous clinical trials of medications as well as non-drug treatments such as Transcendental Meditation for Psychiatric Disorders. His latest book, which we're discussing today, is Supermind. And my first, first of all, welcome Dr. Rosenthal. Thank you. Yeah. My first question for you is a distinguished medical researcher, author, psychiatrist, why Transcendental Meditation? Tell us the story. Well, I like to keep an open mind. And so when a patient actually told me that what was really helping him more than my medicines was Transcendental Meditation, um, which I had done many years before, I was encouraged to explore that further, met up with you, and the rest is history. I started to meditate, become incredibly impressed with the impact, not just on myself, but on patients to whom I recommended it. And then I looked at the literature, I saw there were really hundreds of excellent articles on it, and that I was compelled to write about it, uh, which was my first book, Transcendence, on the subject. Now, my question is, let's just start with some basics. And what we're going to have an opportunity to do here today is to handle some basics. What is Transcendental Meditation? What is it not? Get an idea of how it works how it benefits an individual and helps us deal with the everyday stresses of life and sometimes the chronic stresses of life, the chronic stress-related disorders. But I do want to spend considerable time on, on the picture that you present in Supermind. That is, we are all endowed, we all have as our birthright a capability to be far more creative, far happier, far um, healthier, more productive, more insightful, more connected to ourselves and others than the norm. And yet, this is all science-based, not just some new age promises. So first, maybe you could give a, a definition of transcendental meditation, because you're saying that all this can be done largely through transcendental meditation. Well, it's a deceptively simple practice. It does have to be taught by a qualified teacher, and it's taught over the course of a week. And once you learn, which involves getting a mantra, but even more important, being taught how to use the mantra to access it in a very automatic way, you're often running, or often sitting, I should say. And uh, what then happens is a whole world begins to unfold, a world within, a world of consciousness, uh, starting with the changes that one sees actually during the meditation sessions, a kind of blissful, quiet, boundaryless state that is alert and calm and active all at the same time. And then, and that, this was really what motivated the new book, Supermind, that consciousness begins to filter into one's daily life. I found myself shifting into that new state of consciousness. And 
everything else just began to open up. And there's that wonderful quote at the beginning of my book by William James, which basically a hundred years ago foreshadowed everything that I'm writing about. If you would read that quote, Not I think yet. it would be very illuminating. Not yet. We're going to come to it. We're going to come to it in just a moment. But first, not getting there quite yet. In, in your understanding, but it's a beautiful quote by the father of psychology. In this, you talk about um, transcendence beyond waking, dreaming, and sleepy, you, sleeping. You talk about the physiology of transcendence. And I know your, your book, Transcendence, was about that. So could you talk a little bit about the science behind the actual experience of transcendental meditation before we talk, we'll sort of lay that foundation before we start talking about it seeping over and spilling over into daily life? Absolutely. Firstly, the body changes. There's kind of a relaxation of the muscles as one sits down and begins to meditate. Breathing slows down. Everything seems to slow down, but in the mind there is activity. There is an increase in the alpha waves which are associated with contemplation and internal meditation. And these alpha waves sweep over the frontal parts of the brain, which is where our decision making and our good judgment occurs. And blood flow actually increases to the frontal parts of the brain. So what's actually happening is that brain function is shifting towards being calm and being frontally based, and also different brain regions are showing the same wavelengths in correspondence with each other. It's called an increase in coherence. And that su suggests or indicates that different brain regions are working together more collaboratively. So while the body is slowing down and calming down, very specific and important changes are happening at the level of the brain. And the level of, of the body, I know that there's a considerable amount of research on transcendental meditation funded by the National Institutes of Health for the heart and heart health. And you're famously quoted as saying that if transcendental meditation was a pill, it would be a billion dollar blockbuster. So would you comment on that? Well, the only thing that I would criticize about my statement is a billion dollars really wouldn't be enough. Because I've seen a billion dollars come from drugs that are really copycat drugs, knockoffs on pre-existing drugs with no actual extra benefit over and above what's already there on the market. Uh, and they do a specific things. But here is a technique that does so many different things, both for the body and for the mind, that its value is really almost incalculable. And it continues to have its effect year after year. It's been compared to compound interest insofar as its benefits just seem to grow. But what are these values? Let's talk a little bit about these cardiovascular benefits. Uh, there's wonderful work of Dr. Robert Schneider um, in Iowa who has looked at the effects on blood pressure and study after study has shown a decrease in blood pressure which as many know, is called the silent killer because it can literally kill people through heart attacks, through strokes. And in both retrospective and prospective studies, he's shown and others have shown a, a very significant decrease in death rate due to heart attacks, strokes, other factors. Um, so that, you know, I have a family history of heart disease. My grandfather died at 54, my father at 67. If TM was castor oil, I would take it twice a day. But actually, it's really delightful. It's like one of my most favorite times of the day is to sit down there and think my mantra and just sink into the state of calm and blissful thought and transcendence. And I sometimes say to myself, as I'm going into that state, I say to myself, wow, this is something really nice that you're doing for yourself today. And so here is something that's very pleasant, very easy, easily fits into a day. And actually, because it increases your efficiency and your productivity, many times over repays itself for the two 20-minute episodes. And so um, there are huge physical benefits that anybody really can reap. And we haven't even gotten to the psychological benefits, which are the subject of the new book. Actually, 
I want to address that because before we shift over into that and I read this paragraph, there's a big concern, a lot of talk these days about the whole issue of mental health. I mean, to the extreme of post-traumatic stress that uh, veterans are experiencing, hundreds of thousands of veterans when they come back from harm's way, from combat. But just children and everyone, high levels of depression and anxiety. And I'd like you to, to address that because I know that you make it very clear that if a person has an acute problem, severe depression, suicidal tendencies, or post-traumatic stress, or bipolar disorder, the Transcendental Meditation is a welcome adjunct, but that the person should continue with their course of, of uh, treatment. Could you talk about that? Yes, uh, absolutely. Thanks for asking, because in medicine we have things called standards of care. These are types of treatment for specific conditions which experts have agreed are priorities. So if you've got a severe depression or a suicidal depression, that's not the time to try an alternative treatment or a complementary treatment. That's the time to really stick with the tried and the tested because you just can't risk it with something that's been less widely tested. However, many, many people are already getting standard treatments and are not finding them to be sufficiently helpful. Or sometimes they're getting medications, but the side effects are unacceptable. So many times the addition of these complementary treatments, uh, be they light therapy or transcendental meditation, both of which have been passions of mine in the course of my research and clinical life, if that can be added, that can often really just top up the other treatments, boost the other treatments, or enable you to cut back on treatments that are causing side effects. So I think it's very important to use like transcendental meditation as a tool, adjunctively with standard treatments, and also of course in people who don't have severe illnesses, it can do marvelous things in its own right. How has it helped you? Because I know that you often recommend it to your patients. How has it helped them or helped you with your uh, treatments with them, you know, make progress? Well, what I'm surprised at is how many people, patients of mine, just continue to meditate. It becomes a sort of self-perpetuating practice because it's so self-reinforcing. Once you begin to transcend, once you begin to get those benefits, people just don't want to stop. And so, for example, I've had people with anxiety problems feeling less anxious, being able to reduce their anti-anxiety medications or in some cases discontinue them. Uh, I've had people feeling less depressed. Usually they're not the people with the worst kind of depression. They're people with anxious depressions or reactive depressions. Uh, reactivity responds very well. People are less likely to make mountains out of molehills. They're more likely to look at it and say, ah, oh, that's a molehill, I'm not going <laughs> to worry about it. And so there are many ways, but the, and, and I know I'm kind of itching to get to the subject and, and we're, getting next. Through, next. we're getting through the basic stuff as well we should, but what began to fascinate me was that over and above people with any specific illnesses, with any specific syndromes, people began to find that they became more effective. Their work improved, their relationships improved, things began to go more easily for them. It was almost as though the world was becoming more cooperative. And as they reported it to me, I began to experience it myself. And that's when I thought, wow, over and above what I had written about in Transcendence, over and above helping people with anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder, children in disadvantaged schools, people with addictions, people in prisons, all of whom can hugely benefit from transcendental meditation and definitely should have access to it. Over and above all these people, there are regular people who just want to be more effective, who just want to do the best they can with their mental faculties, whose mind can grow with, these, with this particular practice. And that's where the concept of supermind entered my mind. I should say 
that uh, Dr. Rosenthal is not, maybe this goes without saying, but is not paid by the TM organization. This is just, this is a scientific investigation for him, the work that he's done, inquiry, and he's coming of his own volition, and even a percentage of the sales of Supermind goes to help our work with inner city school, bring transcendental meditation to inner city school kids and veterans who are suffering from post-traumatic stress and women who are survivors of, and children who are survivors of domestic violence. Um, Just a mo for yeah. a moment, there is, there is not 100% true because there is such a thing called psychological income. And that's just the, the joy of just doing something that you feel passionate about. And actually, there's no amount of money that can actually pay you to have that kind of joy. So I feel very privileged to be here today. That was an excellent response. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so getting to this quote, which I think you asked me to read a little earlier on, the father of psychology, William James, wrote over a hundred years ago, and I'm going to, it's, a, it's a paragraph quote, I'm going to read a few sentences, and then I'm going to ask Dr. Rosenthal to comment and read a few more sentences, and we're going to use that as a jumping off point for the next 40 minutes of our discussion. And if anybody has questions that they would like to uh, email in, I think you have the email address, we will get to, them as, get to as many of them as we can. William James, the father of psychology, over a hundred years ago writes, our normal waking consciousness is but one special type of consciousness, whilst all about it, parted from it by the filmiest of screens, there lie potential forms of consciousness entirely different. Well, here's the beginning of this brilliant man's quote. And I think of this, this is the most classical psychologist you can imagine. So as people might be saying that this writing that I'm doing about alternate states of consciousness, or shall I say expanded states of consciousness, because it's like an awakening of a different form of consciousness. As people say, what is this woo-woo kind of thing that you're talking about? I love the fact that this genius, who is a classical uh, psychologist, wrote about it. Alternate states of consciousness, separated from our normal states of consciousness, from the filmiest of screens. What a beautiful expression. He continues onward, William James. We may go through life without suspecting their existence, but apply the requisite stimulus and at a touch, they are there in all their completeness, definite types of mentality, which probably somewhere have their field of application and adaptation. Just, he says everything. Apply the requisite stimulus, in this case, that is transcendental meditation. It's like some secret door where you just have to push the right button and the door opens up and a new world unfolds. And this requisite stimulus is TM. I don't say it's the only one. There probably are other ways to access it. It's just the one I know that's simple, effortless and reproducible because a lot of people can get these expanded states through this. And then to say these are distinct states of consciousness that somewhere must have their applicability. That's what I write about because I did do a survey of meditators, more than 600, created a questionnaire that asked about the various aspects of what we know to be the supermind and uh, was able to define what is the state, what is this applicability of this enhanced state of consciousness, and that's what the pages of the book are full of. Finally, he says, William James says, no account of the universe in its totality can be final, which leaves these, for these other forms of consciousness quite disregarded. Well, that's, that's such a heartening statement because I can already imagine people saying, you know, there are all these problems out there in the world. What are you doing studying consciousness? It's, it's frivolous. But he's saying, no, no account of the universe is complete without understanding what this expanded consciousness is all about. So that's really very validating for somebody who spent several years writing a book, thinking about it, uh, but frankly, enjoying the process. But it, it's nice to hear somebody like William James saying, this is important, the universe, to understand the universe, you need to understand it. Okay, so now we're going to go back to, we're going to build on this. 
consciousness, expanded consciousness. Now, most people who are watching this, they're, you know, they got a job, they got kids, they got, maybe they have acid indigestion in their stomach, they've got a headache, they get chronic headaches, or, you know, back pain, or their, you know, their mother, they're taking care of their mother who has Alzheimer's. Lots of pressures, lots of demands. A lot of people would just like to get through the day. And your message is, there's more than just getting through the day. Yes, we need to get through the day, but we should also... Well, what I would really say, and I love your examples, by the way, because getting through the day, if you're care taking care of a, a person with Alzheimer's, is not an easy thing. Getting through the day, if you are a cancer survivor, is not an easy thing. Or a mother or a father with a lot of kids to juggle and a job to juggle. And yet somehow, when the transcendence enters one's daily life, everything becomes easier. And I'm not just saying this. For example, there's a controlled study of breast cancer survivors showing that the quality of life in those who have been meditating is greater than in controls. So somehow a joyfulness enters one's daily life. Things that would stress one out terribly, as happens when you're a caretaker of an Alzheimer's patient or all the other things Bobby mentioned. These things become easier, you become more effective. Sometimes, I don't know about you, but in my meditation, solutions come to problems. Things prioritize themselves. Things that seem impossible, half of them fall away because they weren't really that important to start with. But I go into my TM sessions and everything's like laid out flat like a messy desk. And by the end of it, it's like everybody, somebody's put it into piles and everything, okay, I'll start there and then I'll start there and these things I can leave for next week or never. Um, so it, it's kind of an organizing principle. So all these people you mentioned, their lives will become easier through, through the consciousness. It's very beautiful. Um, I want to be clear, clarify this point. You said that all these things order themselves. Now I know there are other approaches to meditation called mindfulness, which attempts to order and, or make, make present. And, and Is this something that you actively do when you're meditating to sort things out during transcendental meditation? That's a great question, you know, because certainly in mindfulness, there is an active instruction to the conscious mind to focus, like focusing on the present moment or experiencing the present moment. You're directed. So that's the prefrontal cortex being instructed to do certain things. And um, without comment about its benefits, because I'm not an expert in mindfulness and I know a lot of people think the world of it, so I would never say a thing against it, I'm just contrasting it. Here, instead, you're not being asked to focus. You're asked to access a mantra in a very automatic way that almost takes the prefrontal cortex, the, the deciding, thinking, judging part of the brain offline, and it's actually, you're able to see it in brainwave patterns from something called the default mode network. There's a network of brain circuits that comes online when your brain idles or when you're thinking of uh, distracted things. Your brain comes, certain, this part of your brain, the default mode network, comes online, which is the opposite of what happens in mindfulness. And that somehow is associated with creativity and with things organizing themselves in a kind of effortless way. So um, these are very different practices uh, that you're referring to. Well, this just came up. If you could expand on this, this question just came in. A little bit more on the difference between mindfulness and TM, and then we'll return to what you have here. Yes. Um, well, uh, they're, they're both uh, practices, mindfulness and TM. They both have millions of adherents. They both come from uh, hallowed ancient traditions, the mindfulness from the Buddhist tradition, the TM from the Vedic tradition. Uh, they use different tasks that they ask of the brain. The mindfulness asks you either to focus, which is focused attention, or to access, like access the breathing, access the inner 
experiences or focus on loving kindness, that's all mindfulness. TM, automaticity. Think of just automatically. It's not really not focus. It's really very different from that. That's why you need to have this taught to you because it turns out that in our life in which we're exerting ourselves and being effortful all day long, being effortless actually needs to be taught. It's very paradoxical, really. So your brain is asked to do a different thing. There are different brain waves associated uh, with these different practices. I won't go into the numbers and the kinds, but there are. And they are uh, detailed, incidentally, in my book. There's a different effect on this default mode network. And there is a different goal, stated goal, in that in mindfulness, you are encouraged to access the present moment and through the understanding of the present moment and its moment-to-moment -moment changes to learn the truth of the world as it really is. That's the goal of mindfulness. Whereas in transcendence, the goal is to access this different form of consciousness, which as I've been describing, expands and then almost automatically yields a variety of gifts that I outline in Supermind. Now, again, now, just thank you very much. That's excellent. And we'll get to more of your questions in a moment. And there's many, many, so we won't get to all of them, mm -hmm. but we'll get to as many as we can. Explain, to say expands consciousness means that before that I was constricted consciousness, I was narrow consciousness. What does that mean in my day-to-day -day life? What it means, I think people can live very full lives without accessing the supermind. I think people can sleep well, uh, be wakeful and effective. Fewer and fewer. Dream. <laughs> they can do lots of wonderful things. That's why William James says some people can live their whole lives without accessing it, and you wouldn't know that they were any the worse for it. You know, you really don't know what's different until you've experienced the difference. However, when you access through this opening up of this filmy screen that William James talks about, when you access it, things just become better in many, many ways. That's my experience. That's the experience of more than 600 people whom I surveyed. And many people in the book, including, I should say, some really quite famous people. Um, and I know we all uh, we all uh, love to hear about celebrities. I know I do, and so does most everybody else. And um, in the book, we have uh, an interview uh, by Hugh Jackman. We feature Jerry Seinfeld, Martin Scorsese, the director, actress Cam Cameron Diaz, uh, many, many people who wouldn't seem to have anything in common other than being celebrities, except that they all practice TM and all say it's pushed their boundaries, it's enabled them to uh, think and live and act more successfully, more fully, and therefore I've called this the supermind. But before I leave the topic, I should say you do not have to be famous. You do not have to be a celebrity. I've talked about a homeless man. I've talked about uh, a homemaker who joyfully began to unload a dishwasher while whistling, which doesn't seem remarkable when I say it, except that prior to that, she had totally refused to unload the dishwasher because she was so resentful of the housework. So regular people doing regular things feel this expansion of consciousness, feel its benefits as well. Um, just one more comment on the expanded. That was a beautiful description. When someone asked me about that, I always reminded um, when I was a child and my father, would, who was a wonderful man, but he'd come home from work and he was under a lot of pressure and he was under a lot of stress and financial worries and all that. And he'd be out in, the, in his workbench, you know, work, working, and you couldn't talk to him. He was so focused, you know, it was like tense and he was just like hammering away and nothing else mattered because he was just like, and everything was upsetting to him. And then that's like very restricted consciousness. And he started meditating. And you could just tell that, that that ease, that the awareness which had been so restricted and so narrow and so tense, just began to expand or just regain its normal status, like a wave just spreading out to the whole you know surface of the ocean. And so I th and with that, 
when he was that way, and we all get that way, I get that way, we all get that way, less and less, hopefully, when we meditate, we, we get that way, then all these benefits come. We feel better, we sleep better, we're healthier, more loving to the people we love, more able to listen, more receptive, more insightful. So I think what's beautiful about what Dr. Rosenthal is saying is this is all normal. To talk about so-called higher states of consciousness or expanded consciousness is not the beautiful thing of what Maharishi has done in bringing transcendental meditation out. I want to talk to you about that. Is he's brought this whole notion out unencumbered by philosophy, dogma, um, anything. It's just a practical, everyday, living reality that's universal for everyone. You know, I'm really glad uh, that you point out how ordinary it really is because, you know, when you think of expanded consciousness, maybe you think of people levitating or amazing things going on, but it's just doing regular things, but either doing them better or enjoying them more. And the beauty of the example that you brought out with your dad is that other people sense the changes that are coming over you. Late in the book, for example, I talk about a divorced couple, which is very sad, and you know, there can be amicable, amicable divorces, but this wasn't one of them. They were hostile to each other, they had a child, they were co-parenting and always haggling over uh, the terms of the custody and renegotiating. And one time, the uh, father of the child, who had now begun to meditate, came home and uh, his ex-wife called and started asking to renegotiate the terms and he felt the tension uh, that was left, the residue of the day, and he said, you know, let me call you back later. And he went and he meditated and he came back and what he was able to do was to just listen. And this is one of the hardest things to do mm -hmm. is to just listen to people, really listen. And as he listened to her, he thought, you know, she's really under stress and she was suggesting these new custody arrangements and he was asking her you know how would this work and how would that work and how would it be if if she did this versus that and after a while the ex-wife just stopped and she said who am i talking to i feel like i'm talking to a different person over here and that's how it is we change and it feels like the world around us is changing, but it's really the changes in our state of consciousness that they're picking up and responding to. Mark Excelowitz writes, he has uh, two questions. He said, a lot of people think that they can't meditate because they, they can't make their minds blank. They can't clear their mind of thoughts. Can you explain or comment on that? Yes, well, you know, if I say to you, clear your mind, you start thinking, clear? How do I clear my mind? I take a broom, I'll sweep my mind out so your mind's full of the image of the broom. I'll clean it out. Maybe I'll get the, the window cleaner and I'll start cleaning my... So, so basically, the instruction just fills your mind with all kinds of imagery of cleaning and what does it mean and how am I going to do it and that window stuff is going to smell and the broom is going to make dust and whatever, whatever, whatever. So by saying clear the mind, you're actually filling the mind. It's like me telling you, don't think of the color red. You can't think of anything else. You're only thinking of red. Uh, so, so the mind is a strange thing. Paradoxically, it often doesn't respond to an immediate directive. That's what this brilliant practice that they evolved in the Himalayas, God bless whoever <laughs> figured it out originally, that when you access the mantra in this way, by an indirect way that doesn't ask you to clear the mind out. And in fact, the mind doesn't get cleared out. Thoughts come in, thoughts come out. As the mantra gets accessed, stuff is happening, but it's not the stuff of everyday life that's ladening you down with these burdens and worries and fears and other bad things that are causing you stress. And then Mark has one more question. I just comment on that. In the analogy that we use and, and this idea of making, it, making your mind blank, unfortunately, is a sort of, has been the prevailing sense of what meditation is. Almost the idea of meditation has been hijacked by this sort of sense that you manipulate the surface. And the analogy we use is an ocean. Surface of the ocean is, can be very choppy, wavy, disruptive. They call it the, the 
when we had used the analogy to the mind, the surface of our mind is the thinking mind, they call it the monkey mind or the gotta 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 mind, very you know, rough and tumble, tsunami-esque. And there are two types of meditation. One is called focused attention, as Dr. Rosenthal mentioned, which is a concentration form of meditation. And the other is open monitoring, which is a mindfulness, which is more observational. And that is attending to the surface, one way or the other. In transcendental meditation, we don't mind the surface. We simply access a level of our mind, and everyone has this, whether we believe it or not. It's just it's like our nose is there. This level of the mind, deep within this transcendent level of the mind, feel that the mind is already calm, already settled, already wide awake, so beautifully described by Dr. Rosenthal in Supermind. And transcendental meditation just gives access to that. And when the mind settles down through the use of a mantra, the body gets this very profound state of rest, it wakes up the brain, all this constellation of changes that Dr. Rosenthal is speaking about. So Mark, when you talk to your friend and say they can't make their mind blank, you can say nobody can do that, and we don't want to do that. We want to access a level of the mind where the mind is wide awake and perfectly settled. Mark then asks, why do you think Meditation in general, and particularly transcendental meditation, is becoming so very popular in the past few years. You know, I think there are so many stresses that people are aware of, but I also think that it's like a great secret that is finally being shared by everybody. Um, it was there, but I think that you have to cross a certain threshold, and you have to have people who are perceived as legitimate, and I make these air quotes because I think everybody's legitimate, but somehow when people who are successful, when people who are celebrated begin to meditate, then others follow. And I think that we've now reached a critical threshold where more and more people are saying, wow, well, why, why shouldn't I do that? Look how it's helping all these other people. And I think it's great. And I think that the dissemination of this important message through the media and through writing or interviews or uh, press or whatever, the dissemination is getting the word out. And you see, the trouble is with pharmaceuticals, there are millions or let me not exaggerate, tens of thousands of drug reps going to doctors' offices to get the word out. There's direct marketing on the TV paid for by huge profits of the pharmaceutical companies to get the word out. These things are not uh, present in the case of meditation, uh, which is not uh, a high profit industry. And so I think that uh, it's taken this kind of sharing of information in different ways uh, to get the word out and it's finally happening. Thank you for your question, Mark. In your book, you talk about bipolar disorder and experience. This is something I want to discuss and, and um, these experiences of heightened awareness, heightened uh, sensual, sensory awareness and also uh, those experiences are also seen in the descriptions of quote-unquote higher states of consciousness. How do we know that those people who are having bipolar experiences, and you could comment more on this, are not just or vice of, excuse me, that are just having experiences of so-called higher states of consciousness, they're not just experiencing some bipolar. Well, firstly, let me say that one of the things that people do uh, have when they're accessing higher states of consciousness, and not everybody, but some people, they perceive the world in a more beautiful, brighter, fine-grained, detailed way, and that's part of just the joy of having this higher state of consciousness or expanded state of consciousness. Uh, and I write about that, many people's descriptions. Um, an emergency room doctor who thought that they had repainted her hospital because all of a sudden it looked brighter and she actually checked on it and they had not. She thought maybe they've installed new lights because it looks brighter. So she was seeing the world more brightly and other people, I, I talk about one of my own experiences of walking by some tall flowers and feeling almost as though I was part of the fabric of nature and that I was sort of communicating with the flowers. Now, 
I didn't hear them talking to me. And it was not a psychotic experience. It was an intense, vivid visual experience. Okay, so now these are wonderful. These are rich ways of experiencing the world. What about, say, hypomania, which is the lower form of mania? Well, you're not sleeping well at night. You're interrupting people. Your thoughts are racing. Uh, maybe you're being impulsive. Maybe you're doing things and showing poor judgment. None of these is present when you access higher states of consciousness. So the one little thing you share is this experience of vividness and joy. But all of these other things that are indicative of a disruptive physiology don't exist. Is it possible that um, an exper a, a transcendent experience could trigger a bipolar, or is that just two different brain, brain considerations? I have, it, it's really difficult to say, but I have never seen uh, TM or transcendence actually triggering bipolar disorder. I have seen people who are going into a hypomanic episode having altered states of consciousness which are very clearly different from what we're talking about because they're associated, as I mentioned, with all these evidence-based elements of disrupted um, physiology. Lack of sleep, rapid thinking, rapid speaking, impulsiveness, poor judgment, interrupting other people, not letting them finish their sentences, that sort of thing. That's more indicative of hypomania. Okay, back to your book and another quote. But we will return to some of these questions. I, we're doing the best we can to get to all of their many, many, many coming in. Um, you quote Patanjali, who is a great uh, sage from 2,500 years ago. He um, wrote the manifesto or whatever of yoga called the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. And he writes, through the repeated experience of settling, a continuum, continuum of calmness develops. What I love about this quote, yes, Through yes, the repeated of experience of settling, a continuum of calmness develops. Yeah, what I love about this quote is how short it is and the profundity of the message in the quote. Because if you think of what we do when we meditate regularly is we settle, we act. We have our TM, we settle, we sleep. We wake up the next morning, we settle again. So the repeated experience of settling occurs. And then bit by bit, we experience this continuum of silence. Now, of course, we don't go about our days completely silent. We're talking, we're thinking, we're acting. But underneath all that activity is a kind of inner silence and an inner peace that coexists with activity that's quite unusual. And when I first experienced it, I thought, this is really very interesting. It's almost as though you're operating on two channels at the same time, but they're not interfering with each other. And so when somebody talks to you, you can really listen because there's that silence. It's not like you're thinking of what you're going to say next and just waiting for them to pause in their speech before you chime in. You're really taking this person's thoughts, their speech in. Can you imagine how helpful that is in business, as a psychiatrist, in every sphere of life? If you've got that silence side by side with activity, that's the genius of Patanjali. You have a chapter called Engagement and Detachment, a Delicate Dance in, in the book Supermind. Could you comment? You know, when I trained as a psychiatrist, we learned that it was important to love and to work. Those were Freud's two great things. It's important to love and to work. It's important to do. You need friends. You need partners. You need to be sociable. All these things were given great weight. And so attach was very much emphasized. But what about detachment? That was not so much emphasized. And then, as I grew as a psychiatrist and as the world progressed, we learned that there were relationships that were not healthy, where you needed to pull back. There were ventures that you get into where they were not profitable. You needed to pull back. Maybe you hoped too much. Maybe you had an aspiration that 
eventually proved impossible and you had to pull back your enthusiasm and somehow not go into a crashing depression but just understand the great quote from the Bhagavad Gita that we have control over action alone but never the fruits. So we need to be attached, it says. We, 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 we should not be over-attached to the fruits but we cannot justify detaching from the action. So we must act, hope of course for the fruits but not be over-attached to them because they are not always forthcoming. This is the delicate dance that I hadn't learned as a psychiatrist, that I've learned in my life and now it's been fostered through the TM because as I move into a little bit more of my own supermind, it's easier for me to pull back. You know, yeah, I'd love the book to be a great success, but what if it isn't? Well, you know, I've, I've put in the action, I've got no control over the fruits. So I think whatever it is, no matter how much we love it, we have to be able to retain that capacity to step back and say, you know, I worked hard, I worked as effectively as I could, I don't have control over all the variables. And that's expanded consciousness, yes. is it not? That's not focused and narrow and lost and just obsessively, uh, that's like having the bigger picture, a more mature view. You see children in a sandbox fighting about a, a little, about a, a truck. And as an adult who've grown, we say, no, these kids are just fighting. But then we also, in our sandboxes, fight and we have to keep growing. We have to keep maturing. We keep to have that bigger picture. Maslow spoke about that. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, Maslow, Abraham Maslow was a brilliant psychologist and innovated many concepts, but perhaps one of his most famous, besides his, well, he's got this hierarchy of needs. You, you, it's normally portrayed as a kind of pyramid. Uh, and the bottom of the pyramid is food and shelter and love, things that we need in order to survive. But right at the top of the pyramid is this little triangle, and that is to self-actualize. Whatever it is, he says, the painter must paint, the writer must write, whatever it is that feels like our destiny, we must do if we're to be fully actualized. Now, it often occurs to me that even though it's a tiny little triangle, it's very, very important. And I quote Milton in his sonnet on his blindness, who talks about that one talent which is death to hide. Not to be able to express that one talent is almost like a death. And if you talk to many creative people, people who have a passion, not to be able to engage in that passion and express it, it feels like a little piece of you isn't alive and a very important piece. And that is something that the supermind really helps you with. It frees you up, it allows you to be the best you can be, which is to self-actualize. There's a uh, wonderful quote uh, that I heard from Maharishi where he said, casual attention brings casual results. Casual attention brings casual results. And we've received many uh, questions. This was a six hour webinar, we could get to them all. Um, how important is it for, in your mind, um, for a person to actually meditate regularly, or is it important? It's kind of a leading question, so I'm, I know the answer, but I'm asking it for others. Um, to meditate regularly to begin to um, reap the results of the supermind. Well, one wonderful thing about the survey was uh, I subjected it to sophisticated statistical analysis. And one thing that emerged is that the factors that foster the supermind are regularity and duration of meditation. That actually emerged as a statistical association. So that validates really what TM teachers and proponents of TM have known for a long time. Uh, but I would also say something else. One of the brilliant superminds that I interviewed is the classical guitarist Sharon Isbin, who is, when you talk to her, you just realize what a brilliant woman this is, and she's a magnificent guitarist. And she talks about how the TM has really enabled her to perform at her utmost. But what she says is, you can't just meditate. You also have to put in the work. You have to act. 
And that is something Maharishi always said, meditate and act. Meditation alone is not going to get you there, but action alone is going to wear you down. You need this alternation, the repeated process of settling, as Patanjali said, is followed by the continuum of silence, but he might as just as well have said is followed by success and growth in your daily life. Elisa Gray, Elisa Gray writes, and many other people write, um, that you know, they started meditating and now they've fallen off of it and they're having difficulty getting back to where they were. Could you talk about the importance of, because when a person learns Transcendental Meditation, it is taught over four consecutive days. It takes about an hour to an hour and a half a day over four consecutive days. But then there's a very important follow-up program which I think is a wonderful benefit of Transcendental Meditation and the whole TM organization because when you learn, you have a lifetime of support for, the, you know, for without any additional fee or charge or anything like that. How important has this so-called checking or refreshing been in your practice and what would you advise others? Because again, I think it's regularity of practice, but, but it's also in this crazy world where everything, you know, we're going a million miles an hour and there's so much pressure and tension. It can be easy as Effortless as Transcendental Meditation is, it's also delicate. So that's the value from my side as a teacher of people coming for refreshing or, refreshing or checking their meditation on a regular basis. Well, you know, it's really interesting because a lot of us feel, and I'm one of them, you know, I ought to be able to do this myself. I learned the technique. It's not that difficult. I did it before. I can do it again. So just do it. And then what happens? You don't do it. There's some kind of threshold that holds you back. Now, just before this webcast, Bobby and I sat down together with another friend of ours, Adam, who's behind the camera, and we meditated together. And I don't know what it is. It's somehow somebody else is looking at the time, somebody else is taking you through the steps. And it was so profound and so deep. I will never miss an opportunity when I'm with a seasoned meditator and a meditation teacher to say, hey, have you got 20, 25 minutes for us to sit down and meditate? Because somehow it just keeps the momentum rolling. So what I would say to Alyssa is please give your local teacher a call. Say, hey, I'd love to come in. And you'd be surprised how often that kick-starts the process, and once you're back in the pattern, you will get going. The other thing that I would really suggest is don't think that the time is just going to pop up in your schedule. Most of us have got very packed schedules. I mark my meditation time in as though it was a patient session, and it is. I'm the patient. I need that help that the TM is going to give me. So two things I would suggest. Check in with your local teacher, set time in your schedule. And one last question before we wrap this up. Michael Fitzgerald writes, and many others do too, that they've been meditating for some years, but deep-seated issues um, haven't magically gone away. He puts magically in quotation marks, whether it's anxiety or, or things that are affecting his life. Um, what would you advise? Well, I, I, would, I would say that it's not realistic to expect magic from this or anything. And there are many ways of, um, there are many ways of helping people who've got deep-seated issues. I've got a, a practice of clients, patients, who come to me with issues. And if I could say to them all, meditate, 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 I would be totally out of business. But fortunately or unfortunately, there are many things that people can do that can be helpful. Talking with somebody, unburdening yourself, cognitive behavior therapy, other kinds of therapy. There are many offerings out there. And I would, I would think of meditation, if you think of your diet, I would think of meditation as one of the staples in your diet. I wouldn't think of it as your whole diet or of your self-care program. I've got a complex self-care program myself. Most of us do. It involves exercise. It involves yoga. It involves 
aerobics, it involves free weights, it involves a lot of things because TM isn't going to work on all of them. But without TM, I would really be the worse off and I'm glad I don't have to even go there. Thank you for your question. So we are here talking, we have been here for the last hour talking to Dr. Norman Rosenthal, a renowned medical researcher, in case you're wondering, you're just joining in now, a renowned medical researcher, a psychiatrist for over 30 years, a senior researcher at the National Institutes of Mental Health, and he was the first to uh, describe seasonal affective disorder and recommend light therapy as a treatment, very effective treatment. And he has written several books. The first was, which many of you may have seen, which was Transcendence. It was the first book that he wrote about Transcendental Meditation, a New York Times bestseller. He's now written a book, I think, as great as that was, you're taking this to a whole new level. Because instead of the standard paradigm of understanding that, oh yes, meditation is good, meditation generic, it's calming, it'll allow you to cope with the problems of the day, you've really shown that meditation properly understood and practiced through Transcendental Meditation is a tool to really unfold our full creative potential. And that unfoldment is not philosophical, it's not theoretical, it's a transformation through Transcendental Meditation of the way our nervous system functions, the way our cardiovascular system functions, the way our digestive system functions, respiratory system. It's a profound and practical process of development. And my last question for you is, if William James, over a hundred years ago, the founder and father of psychology, gave this vision of human potential, what happened? <laughs> why, is no, why is it until Maharishi and, and bringing out Transcendental Meditation and this book that you're putting it into lang language of modern psychology and psychiatry, what happened? He was a very, very great man, William James, and there's so much in his writings that only now we are following up on. There's another direction I'm taking. He, he said, when you cry, you're sad. Crying is not just an output of sadness, it also is an input of sadness. And so um, we're using Botox uh, in depressed patients because William James said the body sometimes precedes the mind and if you influence the body, you can change the minds. He was a great man and this writing about the, the varieties of religious experience, which was a major inspiration for this book, is one of the most profound books imaginable. Very, it's dense and it's full of wonderful stories. He says that, you know, he has found that giving many, many examples that are, is more powerful, that no matter how profound a theory is, it's the accumulation of examples that deals a much more powerful punch. That's not his words, those are my words. It deals a much more powerful message, so that's full of rich examples some of which you can really see. He's talking about transcendence. He's talking about uh, the supermind in, in different ways. That is quite intriguing. So when you've got such a visionary as that, it's not surprising that it's taken over a hundred years for it to begin to percolate into the medical field. Well, you certainly are a, a wonderful exponent of the ancient Vedic wisdom of consciousness and higher states of consciousness and cosmic consciousness as brought to light in this scientific age by the great scientist of consciousness, Maharishi himself. And uh, I think William James would be very happy with you, Dr. Norman mm -hmm. Rosenthal. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Rosenthal's book is in bookstores on Tuesday, May 17th, Supermind. You can order it now on Amazon. Uh, and that will help Norman's book become the bestseller that it deserves. And I thank you all for uh, joining. And those of you who um, asked questions and didn't get answers to them, please submit them again if you had some specific question, and I'll do my best to get a reply from Dr. Rosenthal. I want everybody to be happy. So thank you all, and have a good evening and a great week. Thank you.